Okay, you're on your own. All right. Well, how about a toast to podcast number... It's podcast number seven, but number, number one for you. Yeah, number one for me. So okay. thanks for being here. Thanks for uh, volunteering yourself. Well, it was really hard to say no, but it was an awfully long walk. <laughs> 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 but we made it. That's true. So you're a bit of a connoisseur of podcasts. You're always buzzing around with your little earbuds in your ears listening to podcasts. Did you ever think that you would be on one? No, I, as a matter of fact, I didn't, you know. But uh, I really appreciate that that the, the, the Raycon <laughs> earbuds you gave me. I mean, a little shout out to Raycon. I have used those every day, every night, all night. <laughs> Drive your, your mother nuts because... I, you know, I wake up and it's, well, that one's over. So I, I, I reach over to the nightstand, grab it, and I get the next podcast, turn it back on. Of course, the light comes on. And yeah. That disturbs Mambu. And it's not a good thing to disturb Mambu when she's no. sleeping. No. no, probably not. So that your buds have been saving you. But yeah, podcasts are kind of funny like that because yeah. I had actually never listened to podcasts before mm-hmm. Jeremy wanted to start one. And then mm-hmm. I thought, well, I better check some of these out and see how they go. Mm-hmm. But I knew you were really into them and Jeremy's really into yeah. them. So I've discovered that they're actually quite addictive. Oh, they you are. start to find your people mm-hmm. and then you get really into it. And then you're like, oh, they had this person on or they talked about this. Mm-hmm. So it becomes really fun. But I mean, for today, I just kind of wanted to talk about, I mean, we talk a lot on the phone. I mean, I have to be careful when I call you because if I call you, I know that we're going to start talking and we're going to be talking for hours. Mm-hmm. So I can't just call if I know I have something to do in an hour mm-hmm. and because we can really jab. Oh, yeah. Jib jab. Yeah. <laughs> so, no, that, that's, um, it, it's wonderful, you know, at this stage in my life, you know, to be, a, you know, to have two daughters that I can talk to. You know, and, you know, on, a, on an adult level about very serious things and, and then some not so serious things. But yeah, but as you know, I, I, I tend to avoid the um, jibber jabber, you know, the non serious things. Yeah. Know. Well, you were never much for small talk. No, no. no yeah. I, I think life's important. And, um, and a lot of people, they don't. Now, I love humor. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know. I think I'm the funniest guy in the room. You might be. But well, grandma doesn't think so. <laughs> but but uh, I I sure have a lot of fun trying to entertain her. And uh, I mean, yeah, you you can definitely carry a room. That's for sure. So yeah, as far as the small talk thing, you weren't even much for small talk when we were really little. No. Like you always made a point out of knowing us. Mm-hmm. So you would ask us, how was your day? How was school? What did you like about it? What didn't you like? But it, you didn't just ask because you're supposed to ask your kids that. You mm-hmm. asked because you wanted to know. Mm-hmm. And then you would dig deeper. What didn't you like about your day? Well, why didn't you like that? Well, how did it make you feel? Mm-hmm. And this started when we were very young. Mm-hmm. So that's something that I think is really neat because you got to know our personalities very well. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I remember that uh, there was a show, uh, Unsolved Mysteries. Oh. And... Um, that dun, music, dun, 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 dun. Yeah, you just hated that. It terrified you. And I, I liked the show, but I thought it was more important to go upstairs and get you away from that because you didn't like it. I mean, you really didn't like yeah. it. And, um, and we'd go upstairs and we'd just talk. And, uh, you know, you're right. I would ask, well, how did your day go? What, you know, what happened? Um, what did you learn at school? And uh, I remember this one day I asked her, you know, well, what did you really like about the day? She's, well, I did this and this and this. And well, what didn't you like? And she's, Dad, I don't like it when people tell me what to do. <laughs> Still <laughs> <You know>? don't. <laughs> <laughs> and I told her, I said, well, honey, you know, unless you start your own business, people are going to be telling you what to do all of your life. <laughs> right. <laughs> you well, know? and that's definitely something that you instilled in us yeah. at a very young age as well. You used to tell us. That well, you, we would say what we want to do, and you'd say, "Well, that's great if you own the company." Yeah, <laughs> and it and it was like it doesn't matter what you do, but you need to own the company. Yeah, and and so you you instilled that in us at a young age, and had us start businesses when we were kids. Oh yeah, yeah. we were always selling something. Oh, I know. You know, well, you know, I remember that that one summer. Um, well, we always called the best sisters this, the best sisters mm-hmm. that. You know, because it brought the two of you together. That you were doing something together, 
and um, when you started the Best Sisters Cookie Company. And I didn't want you girls just sitting around home doing nothing. Yeah. So I brought you to work, and uh, because I owned the business, I could do whatever I wanted. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, bought a, uh, a big freezer, and we brought all these uh, frozen cookies and a couple of ovens. And you kids learned more lessons, more valuable lessons that summer. Mm-hmm. I remember you came back after the first day and said, Dad, is this legal? <laughs> you know, so why would anybody <laughs> buy a cookie for a dollar? Uh, it's a bargain now. Yeah, what an opportunity to explain supply demand. And yeah, everyone can make cookies at home, but they're not at home. Yeah. They're at the office and it's 10 o'clock and you're standing there with your little basket you know, with your little smile and you've got all these beautiful oatmeal raisin cookies and Otis, you know, it just, I mean, you really had some beautiful cookies there. Yeah. And uh, you'd bake those up. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, then we learned a little bit about marketing, you know, mm-hmm. and we put a flyer together and you, you went over to that, um, that twin story, seven story building and, um, and you were distributing your flyer while well, you got kicked out. We did. Yeah. Who kicks out a like eight and nine year old little girl? The office, you know, the 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 manager of the two buildings, you know, no solicity meant everyone, you know. Yeah. And uh, but so you you got you came back and you and you said, Dad, we got booted. <laughs> we got booted. I said, not a problem. So when you get booted, all you have to do is just take another look at this problem. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna take your little flyer. And we're going to stick it under every windshield you know, wiper in the parking lot. What do you think of that? And, yeah, okay. And away you went. You know, we <laughs> ran off a whole bunch more. The next morning you came back and you said, oh, Dad, there's flyers all over the all over <laughs> the parking lot. I said, don't worry about that. You've got 36 orders. <laughs> Get busy. <laughs> yeah, they started. It was when fax machines were a thing and they, people were faxing us orders. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, the law offices started ordering dozens of cookies for yeah. their meetings. And then the guy yeah. did decide to let us back in the business in yeah. the building because of the demand for cookies. Yeah. Well, what happened is the the uh, the head of Merrill Lynch, uh, he had a sit down with the the management, and he said, "You are going to let these little girls solicit in your building, or we're leaving." You know. <laughs> <laughs> so you had you had the you know the biggest tenant in the building, and um, I mean he used to call me, and and you know and give me you know feedback about how you were doing, and and he thought it was just great. He's just he said the, the lessons these girls are learning. Oh, he said I wish I could do that for my children. Yeah, and uh, yeah, it was great. I it gave us confidence too because we had to learn to speak to adults, yeah. and we were eight and nine, mm-hmm. and we had our little cooler on wheels that we would. Co- and with the milk, and yeah, we hit them right between lunch and breakfast when yeah. they were hungry, and and then they came to expect it. Oh yeah. So that was a that was a great lesson, and I mean, we ran different businesses. You were always teaching us, like with the C's candy bars, we bought those, and mm-hmm. then we would just mark them up, and and yeah. yeah, it was great. We learned about inventory and yeah. ordering, and and just independence, and it gave us the confidence to know that we had. We could go out there and pretty much sell anything. Mm-hmm. Like you were right, the product doesn't really matter. And yeah. so, yeah, it, it was a great lesson for kids. I think that was really, I mean, that at that point we were homeschooling. Yeah. And so we had the ability to do that. So we went to private school, then we were homeschooled, then we went to public school. Mm-hmm. So now hindsight, looking back at that, what... Are you are you glad with the decisions that you are you do you feel satisfied with the decisions you made over education or would you have continued homeschooling or skipped the homeschool or oh boy that is a, that's a, a very good question I think I would have continued the homeschooling a little longer because you know what you learned in school is you know just how cruel kids can be I mean it, you know, we always hear you got to be socialized. You got to be socialized. Well, that's true, but bullying is a major problem in the schools, and it's always been. And there doesn't seem to be a solution to that. And now that we've got, uh, you know, the technology that we've got today, you will say things online that you would never say to somebody. Oh yeah. And uh, 
So you know, young people in the seventh, eighth, and ninth grade, they can be unbelievably cruel. So, um, but there, there was a, there was quite a bit of, of bullying going on in that particular school, mm-hmm. and there was just a couple of kids in the neighborhood, and you know we know what happened to to a couple of them. I mean, they ended up in prison. They or, were so bad. Or worse. There's, or worse. I mean, of our group of friends, yeah, some ended up in prison, some are no longer here. So yeah. it's, yeah, we, we did kind of hang with a rough crowd, which I'm sure made parenting us a little difficult. Oh, yes. <laughs> because that's such a hard thing, because when those are the friends we choose, mm-hmm. how do you tell us you can't hang out with any of your friends? Mm-hmm. Well, I know you chose them because you were being bullied. So you went with the tough kids that could protect you. Yeah, we weren't very big. Yeah, no, you weren't. You were, you were, you were little wee things. And, but, you know, just like the mafia, you know, you pay a price. <laughs> you, you go and you, yeah. you get the protection of, uh, of, you know, these rougher kids and they extract a price. Mm-hmm. And that is loyalty. You got to be loyal. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it, it, uh, it definitely presented some challenges and probably introduced us to stuff that we had no business being introduced to at a very early age. And so I'm sure that wasn't very, uh, very easy to maneuver as a parent because, you know, like you always think your parents know exactly what they're doing when they're parenting or else you think they know nothing. There's, it's always one extreme or the other, but now I'm in the thick of it. Now I have teenagers, so I can see the other side of things. And like you always said that you wanted to say yes more than you said no to us. Mm -hmm. And so where did that come from? Like, why? Because I have no problem saying no. I'm like the queen of no. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, I, I had a philosophy that, you know, when I, when I was raised, I always heard no, because I said so. Because, I, you know, and I thought, you know, that didn't work. Yeah. And I don't think I ever said that because I said so to you. Um, if, if I said no, I would give you an explanation. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, because I really disliked that answer. Uh, growing up, and of course, I heard it about ninety nine percent of the time, and so I would say, um, you know, I love you too much to say yes. Yeah, you know, I do I remember would, that. Yeah. I I wish you could do this, but I love you too much to say yes. You know, I I would never take you down on the freeway, blindfold you, and give you a knife and say, "Have a good day." Yeah, you know, you uh, when you're young, you don't know, uh, you know, the dangers that lurk out there. It's like. A child that puts his fingers in the way of a closing door. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes, you, you know, you just got to get your fingers pinched before you figure out, well, I'm not going to do that again. Right. And um, Well, and we didn't really understand it, I think. So there was a lot of pushback there. And mm-hmm. you're always so disappointed when you find out you can't do something or when other people are allowed to stay the night or go to mm-hmm. the party or, and you're not. Yeah. Um, so even all through high school, all my friends would always go over to Eastern Washington and you wouldn't let me drive on that highway. Yeah. No matter what, I wasn't allowed to go. And then every year, and even senior year, I was like, I'm not even asking. Yeah. <laughs> He's going to say no. Yeah. Well, you know, so many people get killed on that highway. And now, you know, we've moved on to 97. And there's not a week that goes by, because there's 97, 97A. And there's not a week that goes by that somebody doesn't get killed on that highway trying to pass somebody. Yeah. You know, and it's just, it's, you know, when I drive to Anachi, I don't pass anybody. And of course, Mambu's sitting there, hey, you're only going 58. That's, I'm doing fine. I'm yeah. doing fine. <laughs> well, why do you pass this guy? I said, I'm not going to. I'm not going to pass anybody on a two lane road. Yeah. <laughs> you know, no, it's not worth it. I tell the kids the same thing, and I don't, I don't do that either. But I mean, it was always like disappointing to hear no as a kid, but because you think that nothing's going to happen when you're a teenager and you just want to be included. And when everyone's going and you're not going, you feel super bummed fear of being left out, even though nothing fun is really happening. You used to always say, nothings they're not doing anything. Yeah. Nothing good happens after 10. That was yeah. the other yeah. line. Yeah. And, and so now as a parent of teenagers, I see now that even when you want to, there's so many occasions when I want to say yes, but mm-hmm. I think of the risk. And it's like you've spent 15, 16 years raising this child mm-hmm. that are, something that is riskier isn't worth it. Mm-hmm. And that's something that kids can't understand till they're on the other side of it. Yeah. Well, if there was a 1% chance that a plane was going to crash, would you get on it? Yeah, exactly. No. <laughs> no of course not. <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, the risks are just too high. One in 100 is not good. Yeah. 
And I think you're willing to take more risks even with yourself than with your children. Oh, yes. That's what's so scary about raising kids is you care about them more than yourself, but you can't really control them. And then once, you know, like Nevaeh's driving now, Mm -hmm. now she's off Mm -hmm. and I can't. It was so much easier raising toddlers. Everyone thinks when you have toddlers and babies that you're in the trenches, you're in the thick of it. That is the easy part Mm -hmm. because they're there and you can control the whole environment, what they eat, where they go, who they're around. And then you lose that control Mm -hmm. very quickly. Mm -hmm. And that's a very scary place to be. Mm -hmm. And that's, I had a pastor once tell me after 15 is when you do 90% of your parenting. Yeah. And I had all toddlers at the time. And I'm like, no way, I am parenting. And he's like, no, you're not. <laughs> you're, you're wrangling yeah, right yeah. now. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're hurting cats. Yeah, exactly. So you do the parenting as they start to become adults. Mm-hmm. And that's when it gets really tricky. And so I think that it was really nice that you did get to know us mm-hmm. as kids. Because so when I talk to Alicia, who's you know my older sister, you're your firstborn daughter. To Alicia. (laughs) To Alicia, who's not here. She has a very different view of our upbringing. And she Mm -hmm. has a very different view of events that we were both at Mm -hmm. that went the same. And she'll be like, oh, our parents were this way. And then I feel like, well, no, our parents were this way. And then we can be talking about the same event. And she has a totally different viewpoint of Mm -hmm. it. And so then I started realizing that we did have different parents. Mm -hmm. Because different parents showed up, like you showed up different for me than you showed up for her Mm -hmm. at even the same time period. Mm -hmm. So her experience was different because I couldn't really understand why does she view things so differently, but it's because her experience was so different. So when you have different kids, you have to parent them differently, which kids, of course, hate. Well, they do. And, you know, you, you, you like to treat all your children the same but they're different people. And, you know, so we didn't, uh, for the most part, I mean, when, you know, you know, for example, you know, who's going to fight over the bowl of pudding? Who's going to the biggest pudding? Okay. Whoever serves, you know, fill, you know, take the, fill the bowls, you know, and whoever pours the, the pudding into the bowls, the, the other sister gets to choose. So, so it'd make them even. Huh? Yeah, you're going to make them even. Make you know, and you're going to make them as even as you possibly can. And uh, it's a matter of, of just you know teaching you know life's life's challenges. And the uh, there's a wonderful Jewish proverb that says, "Too soon, too old; too late, too smart." <laughs> and I didn't really understand what that meant when I was 21 or 22. I didn't think about it. Now I understand because I'm 74. Yeah, and. Uh, I get smarter every day, but it's often too late you know, to to change things. But um, but uh, no, we, we did. We, you know, we did. Uh, for example, you know, Alicia, she was older than you, and she would pull stuff on you, and she would say, like when I picked you up at school, "Cool dudes in the back seat." And well, you'd bail into the back seat. She'd just you know take you in. <laughs> totally with that. manipulating you're, me. Yeah, you cool dude, and then she'd look at me and smile. You know, and, um, but you had a skill that she didn't have and you could jump, you could jump over dogs, you could jump <laughs> over her, you know, and of course I was controlling, you were hanging onto my fingers and yeah. I could control how high you could jump, but she couldn't jump like that. <laughs> and that, that sticks in her craw to this day. It does. And, but she, the, yeah, the reason, the reason I did that is because that gave you you know, something that you could do better than she could do because she could do so many things better than you because she was 18, 19 months older than you were. Mm-hmm. And she, you know, that's a long time. Yeah. When, when you're, you're a three kid. years old. Yeah. Yeah. A three and a half year old and a five year old. That's a big spread. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, you know, that was the, you know, but it still bothers her to this day. But, you know, she never stops to stop and think that, you know, the you know she got to stay up later and she got to do other things that you didn't do because mm-hmm. you were three and a half or four or five and you know she was you were never going to catch her you were always younger than her yeah. you were always going to be yeah. until you got to be eighteen or nineteen or twenty that it didn't matter anymore right but uh, but that was the reason for that and um, you know so it's uh, you know 
leaders are readers. You got to read a lot. And I've always read a lot. And I'm not saying I'm a leader. I'm just saying that I've read a lot because I love to be able to get in the mind of a Winston Churchill, you know, during the Battle of Britain. You know, what was he thinking? Mm-hmm. You know, and, um, the, you know, I mean, it, it's it's absolutely fascinating, you know, the rise and fall of the Third Reich inside the Third Reich. What were these people thinking at the time under tremendous duress? You know, the Nazis on one side of the uh, of the uh, English Channel and the, you know, the Brits and the Americans on the other. But what were these men thinking? And how did they reason things through? And it dawned on me one day that the reason they were able to lead is because they had read about Alexander the Great. They had read about, um, you know, the Greeks and the Persians and the, and the wars of Nebuchadnezzar and the Medes and the Persians. And, um, you know, and they knew that this too shall pass, you know. And uh, so yeah. I tried to take what I learned and apply it to my own life and to your lives. And, uh, you know, because um, there are certain things you need to instill in a child and, and there's a lot of people think that's bad. Oh, you just got to let them be, you know, you know, free range children. Yeah. That's fine for chickens, but that's not good for children. That's a big, uh, that's yeah. a big thing right now. Free range children uh, yeah. and, or unschooling is a really popular trend right now mm-hmm. where you let kids lead their education. Mm-hmm. But I mean, what kid wants to learn algebra or, yeah. <laughs> or, or sit there and drill their times tables? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, doesn't any child choose to do that? Yeah. So that's where the concern is. Is, I mean, what kid really knows what's great for them? And so I think, yeah, that was another good thing. It's like you wanted us to make choices, but you only gave us two. Yeah. You want vanilla or chocolate? You want to wear shorts or pants? So we yeah. got to, we had some ownership, but yeah. we were still directed. And I think that's important mm-hmm. because there's, you know, you can't just let kids dress themselves or, I mean, I, I let my kids dress themselves when we're at home and- I mean, Eli spent nine hours in an astronaut costume yesterday. Yeah. So if we were going to school, like obviously yeah. he would need some direction. Mm-hmm. But no, I, I, I did that early on, you know, I thought it's so important to learn how to make decisions. And often parents, they're in a hurry. So they lay out the clothes for the kid for the day. And it used to just drive me nuts. I'm in first grade and it, I, I used to try to get up. So I could grab some clothes, but my mother always beat me to it. It ruined my day. <laughs> you know? And I remembered that, you know. So I thought, well, I'm going to take that learning experience and I'm going to let you girls, you know, make decisions as early as possible. And that's why we go into Basket and Robbins and they've got 37 or 38 flavors in there. Mm-hmm. But you could have chocolate or vanilla. And when you got a little older, we throw in strawberry. And then that's so you learned how to make decisions right and then well i don't like this flavor well that's too bad you chose (laughs) yeah nobody asked you to you know choose the lime green ice cream and uh so you can live with the consequences well you weren't that harsh i remember swapping out the ice cream cone with you quite a few times you didn't care that we had drooled all over you'd still give us (laughs) your ice cream so yeah it's a well, you girls were awfully cute. You were hard to say <laughs> no to. <laughs> no, but I mean, there's definite, there's definite memories of growing up of very intentional parenting by mm-hmm. you, which mm-hmm. I think is important because we get so busy and there's not a lot of, sometimes as parents, we can just go through the motions. Yeah. Like, let's go, get up, but we need to do this and this. And, and there's not a lot of intentional stuff. So there may be things set up for Mm -hmm. social media. Like, look Mm -hmm. at, we're making this craft. Isn't this cute? Mm -hmm. But it really, it's just chaos. But then everyone's like in the photo. But you did intentional parenting that, um, like sneaking into the hot tub. So we would sneak into this. It was an, was it an apartment or a hotel? It was an apartment, right? And so you would shimmy one of us over the gate (laughs) and then, because it would unlock from the inside. Mm -hmm. So you did teach us how to um, break into places. Uh, but it was innocent, right? Like it was kind of innocent mischievousness. Mm -hmm. And so we felt like we were like partners in crime, but we weren't really hurting anyone. Mm -hmm. And so that was kind of fun. Mm -hmm. And then we would get one orange soda that we would share. Mm -hmm. And then, because we didn't really do soda growing up. So we would share the one orange soda Mm -hmm. and then we would sit in the hot tub and then we would find Venus and it was whoever could spot Venus coming out. Mm -hmm. And so these, it was just a memory, but really it was just 
it's not that you wanted to go drive there and Mm -hmm. you would be like, I want a hot tub. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you actually really wanted to go hot tub after work. What you wanted to do was sit there with Alicia and I and talk to us. Mm -hmm. And it was just a way of getting us in a space away from television or toys Mm -hmm. or distractions. Mm -hmm. And then we would just talk for like two hours till we pruned. Mm -hmm. And so that was always just a really nice thing. Mm -hmm. And and so, I mean, very intentional parenting that goes on there, which I think is so important and so often missed in busy society. Well, it was an adventure. Yeah. Too. It was, it, I mean, it was... Breaking it was, in. Yeah, breaking in. Yeah. yeah. But see, um, we didn't know anyone that lived at that apartment complex. No, we didn't know <laughs> <You> anyone. Know? <laughs> <laughs> no one knew. But we didn't have our own hot tub, so we'd go down. And uh, But it was an adventure. It was fun. Yeah. No, and it, are there it was anybody dangerous. in the tree? It was dangerous. Exactly. Yeah. Hey, I see shadows. <laughs> Did you see that movement? You know, <laughs> oh, and uh, it was like when we went camping, we'd go on bat walks. Yeah. You know, and then, and we were always looking for Long John Silver. You know, <laughs> I don't know. With, Why with, would he be there? <laughs> <laughs> he was always there, I, hiding in the trees. Mm-hmm. You know, and he had a hook for one arm and a peg leg in the other. Yeah, and then, yeah, and we'd be like, no, stop. <laughs> Yeah. We know when the story. Oh. Yeah. 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 It was I, I just think stuff like that is so good and so important because it doesn't it doesn't take money or anything like that, but it's something that sticks with you. Mm-hmm. And so now, like anytime Eli's all into space, and now every time that he's like, there's Venus, like it just brings me back to yeah. that childhood memory, which I think is so cool. Mm-hmm. Because I don't remember a lot of childhood, but I remember going to the hot tub and finding Venus and drinking an orange soda. Mm-hmm. And like, I even remember like press, we wanted to, we'd take turns pressing the button and the thump of the soda. Like it was a, vi- it's a very vivid childhood memory that we mm-hmm. would do all the time. Yeah. Well, it was, it was fun. Yeah. And uh, remember the time um, my father came over and you guys tried to stop him from leaving. So you piled a bunch of snow behind the tires of his car, <laughs> thinking that he wouldn't be able to leave. Yeah. And uh, um, you were out in the yard. That that was, I remember that, you know, you found a doll. And there had oh, been yeah. a doll that had, it, you know, frozen to death yeah, in she the fell. snow. And and you and so I went, I got my the video camera and, and I, and you'd left it there like in the summertime. You were playing down in the yard. We had lived in 1.7 acres. We had a you know, pretty good sized yard. And you'd left a doll out there and she had frozen in the snow. She'd been there for five, six months. And uh, and I I picked her up and I said, I, I hope you girls never forget what this looks like. A frozen doll. <laughs> so this fair. doll, you not only you hurt her little plastic feelings, I don't think she's ever going to be the same. Yeah, but no. you gave her CPR and <laughs> yeah. brought her back to life. Same with the cabbage patch that drowned up camping. You had to fish her out. She got CPR too. Oh yeah, yeah. So she fell off the bridge. Yeah. And I went. I, I got my fishing rod and we hooked her. We pulled her up out of the water, and immediately gave her CPR. Yeah. On the bridge. I think it was one of those talking cabbage patches. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's funny because it's just all these things of being like a little kid, you just feel like you're going to be a kid forever, and then all of a sudden you're the parent of the little kids, mm-hmm. and now all of a sudden the whole dynamic, like even our relationship is so different. Now, when we're talking, instead of like you giving me all this life advice, mm-hmm. it's now it's it's parenting stuff because you're now on the other side of things. And so I realized so many things that you told me, like I now tell our kids, even though maybe they drove me nuts at the time. Mm-hmm. So you always wanted to have daughters. You always said like, oh, I only ever wanted to have daughters. Why did you only want to have daughters? Which you ended up with two daughters. But but why? Why did you want to raise girls? Because I'm a terrible athlete. <laughs> that was it? That was why? <laughs> as much as anything. You don't want like, the pressure of having to throw a baseball? Uh, no, I, I, it just, well, yeah, to throw a baseball and the kid can't catch it because you <laughs> threw it over his head. <laughs> you know, <laughs> That more, was the determining well, factor? Well, uh, that, that had a lot to do with it, you know. And um, But no, I, I just, I liked... I just like little girls. They were just, there was something about them. They were, their little nature. They were, I mean, they're really different creatures. Yeah. And, um, and little boys, um, I mean, I would have been, you know, perfectly happy with that, you know, if I'd had two boys, but, uh, but, you know, there was some, something about the, uh, you girls, you were, you were a lot of fun. You know, you really were. I mean, you, I don't know. It wasn't really a matter of, of, to please it was just you matured 
beyond your years because we dealt with you as you know little adults mm-hmm. and uh, you know worked on your vocabulary and things like that so that you could you know express yourself and um, it was uh, it was just really you know a beautiful thing to watch you uh, turn in you know from toddlers to to you know little three and four and five year olds and then you know preteens and and teenagers and but <laughs> that's you know, where the challenges start oh, boy it did but remember how i used to deal with you when you when you were bad see there's a difference between correction and punishment yeah. punishment that's for the government they can punish <laughs> a murderer i never thought parents should be punishing their children they should be correcting them you know you raise up a child you don't jerk them up you raise up a child and um so what it is was, that saying uh, by Chuck Schwindel? What is it? Uh, the child has a a will like steel, but a spirit like an eggshell. Yeah, and you have to bend the will without shattering the spirit. Yeah, well, it's actually uh, Dobson. Oh, okay. Used to, and um, and he said that the the will is made of spring steel, and the um, the spirit is like an eggshell, and you need to shape the will without without damaging the uh, the spirit yeah because you can you can just crush a young child so easily mm-hmm. and um you know young, you know men they end up in prison and you ask them what happened to you well my dad did this to me or my dad said this or he always picked on me he always mocked me he always made fun of me mm-hmm. and um and it's easy to say well you're an adult now and yeah. you need to pick yourself up but when that spirit's been shattered at such yeah. a young age like it's hard to put those pieces back together in many cases it's impossible yeah, you know, and um, it's all too often it's it's impossible. You can you can damage a human being for life, you know by you know and and they can act and often they will they'll you know they they will overcompensate for their insecurity. Another thing Dobson said that was very interesting that always stuck with me. He said he was inter- you know when he was first started he would pick people up at the airport. He said we had a crew of, of three people. And I would go to the airport, LAX, two hours away, bring them back, and um, then we'd do the show, and then I would drive them back. And he said, no, these were people that had written books. They were well-known, and they were, you know, a lot of, oftentimes PhDs. And he said, before we got back to the airport, inevitably the conversation would turn to, how did I do? Hmm. How did the interview go? And he said, these people... They, they had no need to even ask that question. They were so good mm-hmm. at what they did. They were so professional, but they still wanted to know, good job yeah, or not? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Are you happy with that? Yeah, I think that's a natural like human emotion. You don't ever want to let somebody down. I don't know if anybody actually carries themselves as confidently as they portray, mm-hmm. even very professional people that are very polished. And maybe they are so polished because they do have a level of, um, you know, just feeling not enough. And so maybe that's why they are so polished. Mm-hmm. So I almost feel like the more confident people are a little bit sloppier with their speech and a little more laid back because whenever I see someone super, super polished, I, I kind of wonder if there isn't a little bit going on where they're, <laughs> they're feeling, you know, a little ill-equipped or mm-hmm. something. So, Well, Mike Tyson, he said, you know, that bad habits are easy to form, but mm-hmm. difficult to live with. Good habits are hard to form, but easy to live with, you know. So, being <laughs> Mike prepared, Tyson, that's yeah, Mike, yeah, little words of wisdom from Mike Tyson there. Yeah, yeah and and then he punched the guy in the head and ate his ear. <laughs> yeah, and ate his ear. <laughs> yeah, but uh, he's quite a character. He is a character. I will give him that. Doesn't he have tigers or something like that? He's into something. Oh, probably. the tigers or birds or something. Yeah, probably. I saw a wonderful interview that he that he did with uh, Barbara Walters. Uh, years ago, and, and, and of course she was ABC, and uh, I think it was ABC, viral, maybe, yeah, it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Anyway, she's in this palatial mansion down in Florida, and it had 36 bedrooms in it, and I mean, Mike made, I think, $450 million fighting, Jeez. you know, I mean, a lot of money, <laughs> Yeah. And, but he spent it all, he managed to spend it all, and um, so uh, she asked him, the first question out of her mouth was, Mike, What's the problem? <laughs> yeah, like you why know? are you not happy? Yeah, and he said, and he leaned forward, he put that great big fist in his hand, he said, I can't get enough. 
I can't fly high enough. I can't get enough cars. I can't get enough women. I can't get enough food. And he's living in a house. He said he hadn't been in it in over three years. He said, well, what do you keep it for? Well, it's for my entourage. Hmm. Well, that explains how he went through four hundred yeah. and fifty million dollars. Pay all those people. Yeah, and, uh, just to be there. Like, how yeah. insecure are you that you have to pay people to be around you? Yeah, yeah. That's sad. It is. It well, would be you, lonely. Yeah, I've never had that problem. But, <laughs> <laughs> you, know. you never had to pay people to be around you. No, no. Yeah. No. Yeah, I mean that's kind of that's a hard thing because it's like we want to teach our children to use their gifts and become extraordinary people. But maybe pushing, I've, I've been struggling with this with like Nevea, for instance, has so many gifts. And so I'm always like, you could be a, a famous singer. You could be an actress. You, I mean, she could go beyond Broadway. She's got it all. You know, she's got the stage presence and the camera presence and she could go be a talking head. She could really go do whatever she wants. But she's like, I'm going to get married and have kids. And I'm like, ah, but you have all these gifts. And she's like, well, that's what you did. And, and so I should feel flattered that she wants to, to do what I did, that she looked at what I did and said, that looks nice. I want to do that. Like that should be a good thing. But then I look at all these talents she has and I don't want her to waste them. Mm -hmm. But like, I'm, I just worry like by pushing your kids to be extraordinary, maybe they don't want to be extraordinary. Mm -hmm. Maybe they don't want to be known. Maybe they don't, you know what I mean? So like, I always felt like she was wasting these talents and she, these gifts that she has. But then it's like, maybe I should just encourage her to be happy. Mm -hmm. And then maybe extraordinary will come later. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. It's a hard balance when you're trying to direct your almost 18-year-old to, to pick something. Mm -hmm. Well, I, re I was thinking about that very thing a couple of days ago. And I don't, I don't know why, but I had a friend, Dr. Colin Campbell. And he's up at Fraser University in British Columbia. And, you know, he was a friend of mine in, in, in school. And um, he worked very hard to get his PhD. I mean, I think he worked at it for eight or nine years. He put himself through school as a dealer, a blackjack dealer. Hmm. And, uh, so, you know, so he did it the hard way. Yeah. But, um, you know, Colin was a very unique individual, very funny. He always had a great sense of humor. But, uh, I mean, I never thought... It would be Dr. Campbell, you right. know, because not that, you know, he, he um, but, you know, I remember driving around with him, like we'd, we'd skip school and we used to go down, well, you know, there'd be like seven or eight of us, we'd pile in his car and we would drive down to the courthouse and we would just sit and watch, you know, criminal proceedings, <laughs> you know, because we for thought fun. It was, yeah, for fun. <laughs> Before was, the internet. <laughs> yeah, it, it was, yeah, it was interesting, you know, and. And we'd go to Superior Court and we'd watch, you know, people and prosecutors and, you know, go through. It was, it was an educational thing. Probably more, we learned more than we did if we'd stayed in school. Well, you took us to do that. Yeah. When we were kids. Yeah. 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 Sometimes you would come pick us up, usually on a Friday in mm -hmm. the middle. Of, so you would let us go to school thinking that we had to be there all day. Mm -hmm. And then you would have the, um, the, the principal announce, Alicia and Melissa, your dad is here to pick you up. And you would have them announce it because then the other kids would be like, and so it was kind of like, we'd be like, bye, our dad's yeah. taking us to Applebee's and you would let us skip out on half day and we'd go to Applebee's and we would mm -hmm. get nachos and hot wings. And mm -hmm. then we would, sometimes we would go to the court yeah. and watch criminal proceedings. Because yeah. <laughs> yeah. you were like, you're, you're learning more doing this than watching Reading Rainbow at, you know, on yeah. a Friday afternoon. You knew on Friday afternoon the mm -hmm. teacher was done. Yeah. So we weren't learning anything at that point in the day. So you would come get us early and then we would go do something yeah. educational. Yeah. We look at the, you know, the legal system. Say, you know, here's the prosecutor and there's the judge. Yeah. And here's the, uh, you know, the criminal defendant. And this is what the guy did. And um, it was the, you know, the, you know, the, the concept of blind justice, but that sometimes it wasn't so blind. <laughs> yeah. And it, but it was, it was uh, the kind of thing that a lot of kids that age would never see. Yeah. Unless they got a speeding ticket or something and, and they were, had to go to court, but. But uh, I, I remember going to court and, uh, you know, one, one of Alicia's um, uh, friends was they uh, got himself in trouble and I went and, and represented him. You, know? <laughs> you represented him like his attorney? Yeah. <laughs> you can just have anyone represent you? Well, you can if you've got the nerve to do it. 
<laughs> you know, but the best way to do it now, I feel, you know, is get power of attorney. Did it work out? Oh yeah, oh. sure, absolutely, <laughs> good. <laughs> you bet. Wouldn't that be terrible if it didn't? If they're like just throw the book at him? <laughs> yeah. Well, it would have been worse if they're throwing the book at me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but no. They're like, could, wait a minute, you're not yeah. on the, you don't. Yeah. You're not an attorney. Yeah. But see, if you get a power of attorney, and they sign it over, now you are them. But can you? Then you have power of attorney. Yeah, right? power of attorney oh. over that appearance. Oh, and the judge and and you know one time I did it and the judge said, uh, you know, for Mr. Thompson. I said, oh, we've got two Mr. Thompson here, you know, and because he knew what I was doing and, and that is, you know, the power of attorney. He, he Mr. Thompson, had given me the authority to speak on his behalf. Wow. Even though I'm not an attorney, and it was totally legal and binding. And the judge could not, he could no longer deal with Mr. Thompson. He couldn't look at him. The court had, to, huh. had was blind to him. He had to deal with me. You really let us hang out with some characters, you know. I know. Yeah. Yeah, too many. Well, I think you got to know them too, though. Yeah. And and so we thought that that was kind of a, a source of embarrassment when we were kids, because we knew if we brought our friends over there, you were going to be like, so what do you do? What do your parents do? Yeah. What do you, do you smoke? Can I have a cigarette? And you would sit there and you didn't smoke, but you would yeah. <laughs> sit yeah. there and have a cigarette with them. Yeah. And then you would tell them how they shouldn't smoke. And, yeah. um, but they were always, some of them liked to talk to you. Yeah. Most of the times, like one kids that didn't have dads and mm -hmm. stuff tend to like those conversations. Mm -hmm. And then our other friends of mine were like, we're not going to your house. <laughs> yeah. I want to talk to your dad. You know, he corners me for three hours. Yeah. Told me that he shouldn't smoke. And yeah. and so it was pretty funny. So you knew them too. So yeah. maybe that was. Well, I bet every one of your friends from high school still remember me. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, how could they forget? I, mean, I think yeah. they talk to you more than they talk to their own parents. I mean, not yeah. even always out of choice. But Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But it was good because you should know who your kids are hanging out with because the reality is once they're teenagers, their friends have a high, far higher impact on them and the choices that they're making than the 16 years of parenting yeah. leading up to it. One bad friend can change everything. Oh, yeah. And so that's horrifying now for me because I've had mine in such a bubble mm -hmm. that I'm like, I don't want them to have any bad friends. Yeah. <laughs> well. <laughs> Just erase everything. So, well, my dad used to tell me that all the time. He said, you don't bring people up. They bring you down. Yeah. And I said, no, no, I can, I can bring them up. And, uh, but he was right. Yeah. Could <laughs> oh. you, I mean, could like, really, do you think you can, or do you think that mostly friends just bring kids down? <sighs> well, you know, it depends how strong you are. It depends how confident you are in what you know. And, um, that's why you know, it's so important to, to actually, you know, teach your children well. There was a, Cosby, Stills, and Nash had a song, Teach Your Children Well. Beautiful song. And, um, and that, that is so important. And so many parents are so busy. And mom is busy. And they're, they're both working. And they, they rush home. They get off at 5. And, and they get there. And now they're having dinner at 6.30. And there's just so little time to interact. Um, that your children can grow up right under your nose and mm -hmm. you don't really know them. Right. And they have this mindset that you don't care, so why should they care? And they're there, they're just trying to deceive you mm -hmm. all the time. I'm going to go over to place A, but they're really going to B or oh, C yeah. or D. Yeah, that's and, that old trick, of course. Oh, sure. And I mean, some of the things I found out about, you know, you and, mm -hmm. and your sister shocked me. I thought I had a pretty good handle, but, you know, you guys, you were, you were pretty slippery. You know, you, yeah. if you made up your mind, you were going to do something, you'd do it. But, yeah. But, you know, we used to let you, like, you used to sneak out of the house once in a while when you were young. We oh, you mean you, at night? Yeah, at night. We, did, knew you, we knew you did it. Really? Oh, sure. Oh, I assumed you would have killed us. No. I, we used to take the creepy trails in yeah. case you went out looking for us. Yeah. <laughs> No. Man, if I knew you didn't care, I would have just walked on the road where the streetlights no, were. No, no, but it, it was just, it, it, again. You I, didn't it, stop us from sneaking. You knew we snuck out? Yeah. And, That's interesting. But it was an adventure. I would have killed my kids. I knew you weren't, getting, you weren't going to get in any, any real amount of trouble. Right. And that more than anything, you're going to wake up because you know the rules. 
I told you, I don't care what time you go to bed, you get up yeah. at six, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, so stay out late on a Friday or Saturday, we got you got you up. Well, yeah. I didn't let you sleep in. Yeah. And that was so that you would pay the consequences of staying up too late. It was worth it. That you'd think about it. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, you knew where we were going because there was one house mm-hmm. that we would go to. Yeah. And the mom, it was single mom, and she didn't, she had, she didn't care what was going on. Yeah. So that's where we were going because all of our other friends, there's no way you could go to their house. Yeah. So maybe you just knew where we were going. And we were just going over to their house, and we were over there all the time during the day. I don't know why we felt the need to go at night. Yeah. I snuck out three times. Yeah. yeah. And then I would try to shimmy back up the, um, the fence. Yeah. And then onto the little roof and then back into the, and I'm, see, and up until just now, you just blew my mind. I thought I got away with yeah. it. Oh. oh, man. I thought I was sneaky, like a ninja. Yeah. Dang. Well, my mother had a Jaguar <clears throat> and when I was growing up and I used to sneak it out all the time. <laughs> oh, so, <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. oh man, that's brave with grandpa as a dad. Yeah. Oh, he would have tanned your well, hide. It was a big house and he was at the other end of it and it was multi-story and, um, but boy, that 3.8S Jaguar Mark 10, <laughs> you know, fastest sedan in the world. I never took it to 160, but it would do that. What if uh, you had crashed it? Oh, well, that's why I never took it to 160. I never took it over 120. I never would have been born. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. If, well, if my dad had caught me, you never would have been born. Yeah. <laughs> Probably. He was a no bull crap kind of guy. Yeah. He, yeah, it's funny because you were raised by pretty strict parents. Yeah. I mean, Grandma Lucille's 99 and she's still like that. Yeah. She looks like she'd be like a real sweet little grandma, but then she's like kind of mean. Yeah, yeah. And I love that about her. Mm-hmm. But like as a mom, I I could see her being, because even when, when she was a younger grandma, she was like, knock it off. Yeah. Bah, bah. yeah. <laughs> Eat your porch. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, she was, she was like always kind of like that, which... Which was funny. Um, but I think she would have been a scary mom. Yeah. And then couple that with grandpa, forget it. Yeah. That's a scary couple. I remember one day my mom, she, um, uh, we'd done something and she said, you're grounded. And I said, oh, come on, mom. You know, you know Rod and I, we're, we're going to go out. And, and uh, she said, no, you'll just make, you know, you'll just, you'll make a mockery of this thing. You're grounded. You're both grounded. You can't, you know, you're not supposed to be doing anything. I said, mom, you know, we're just going to go. over. So she let us. And we, so we drove up the block, then we turned around, we came back, blew the horn, and she came to the door and we yelled out the window, sucker, you're a sucker. You know? Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay. Of course. Wow. We, no wonder you drove her crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So, but you know, it was in, it was in fun and she knew. So maybe this is why you only wanted to have daughters. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> you know what growing up with a bunch of brothers was like, boys are very different. Raising boys is very different. Yeah. Than raising girls. I feel like I understand girls now. Like I feel like I understand the mind of a teenage girl and the emotions of a teenage girl. Um, boys are different. Kaimani's starting to go through that stuff now and I don't quite know what to do with it. He's very um, standoffish. Like girls want to talk about everything. Mm-hmm. We're in a bad mood. We want to tell you why. Mm-hmm. And then we're going to tell you why you're wrong. And then we're going to argue with you. We're like boys just say nothing, mm-hmm. but they're in a bad mood. Mm-hmm. And so then they just leave you wondering. Mm-hmm. Did I do something wrong? Like he makes me insecure. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm yeah. like, was it something I said? <laughs> like you know, but it wasn't. Mm-hmm. He's just, but it's it's just so different. So, I mean, everything was really peachy with us as kids because we were able to be ourselves. We were able to express ourselves. Mm-hmm. Most of the time, you would just laugh if we would get into a grumpy mood or something mm-hmm. like that. You would just kind of laugh it off, and um, and you would kind of appreciate just the ridiculousness of it. And then when we became teenagers, it became very different. Our relationship became a little more uh, tumultuous. Mm. And so I don't know, that's, I, that was a weird switch even for me because I remember being 15 and then starting to fight with you, which Mm. was a new thing. Mm -hmm. So even though we're very alike, me being a female and you being a male, we're just wired differently. So our personalities are the same. Mm but yet the mannerisms are different. Like I've been reading a bunch about just gender differences and stuff like that recently because I'm trying to understand my teenagers without getting too into the psycho babble of it. Like I don't want to overthink it and start Mm. reading these self-help books and stuff like that. But I'm trying to understand just the differences of males and females. And I was reading that females are like, 
they rank higher in like neuroticism mm -hmm. and which I mean, makes sense. Like I'm a very kind of neur neurotic, such a negative word, but you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. women do tend to be a little more neurotic. We want our homes just so we want our children just so we want our relationships just so and guys are like, eh, whatever, <laughs> you know, like far less so. And then like women are more agreeable. Mm -hmm. But that's not always a good thing because we can be so agreeable that we suppress things mm -hmm. until we become resentful. Mm -hmm. And and I think that's where like men are less agreeable and then we'll just say stuff. So I think that's like, even though we had the same personality, you would just say stuff to me and then I would just kind of try to be agreeable until I would be, till I would explode. And then you'd be like, where did that come from? Mm -hmm. So I mean, not that we had these big fights or anything, but no. there were a few like leading up to me going to college and stuff, when I was trying to be an adult and you were trying to tell me that I don't know what I don't know. Mm -hmm. And I didn't like that. Mm -hmm. So. Well, I was trying to explain to you that, that um, you know, the, the cycle of life, when you're young and you're going to school, you know, that those friends that are so important to you mm -hmm. in high school that you won't even know them in five years. They will not be part of your life now. I didn't know Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Know? So, you know, that has changed. But for the most Not part, really. even though you now know them, you don't have to go to your school reunion because mm -hmm. everyone's up to date. Yeah. They don't um, even do them anymore. Yeah, exactly. Because there's there's really no need, but they're still not a part of your life. No. You know, and uh, you just sort of, you know, they've got four kids and they're married to a guy that, you know, is yeah. an architect or whatever, you know. So uh, you you know a little bit more information, but you're not any closer. It doesn't bring you closer. Yeah. And, um, now I I always like you know, rules. I like um, you know I did a lot of motivational um, you know consumption, like people like Zig Ziglar mm -hmm. uh, about goals and how do you set goals? Goals. Things. Goals. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, but you know I he said you know the, you can uh, if you don't have goals you know, you're just treading water. Yeah. And, um, and things like, you know, you, three things. You need someone to love, something to do that's meaningful, and something to look forward to. Now, yeah. that's pretty simple, but that's something to look forward to. It can be a vacation, yeah. going somewhere or doing... But it, you know, it sort of fills in the why am I here? Mm -hmm. You know, the, the Germans call it zeitgeist, and, uh, but in English it's worldview what is your worldview you know you look in the mirror and you think why am i here you yeah know, where, did, where did where did life come from on this planet you know is there a god is there a creator if so has he spoken which religion is right you know there's a lot of questions that people get into and and um you know socrates said the unexamined life isn't worth living and then he went out in the back alley and took a gun to his head and <laughs> I'm oh. kidding. I made it up. Oh, oh, that there didn't happen. No, there were no guns. No, oh. no. Socrates. Oh, oh, <laughs> he lived oh, 300 oh. years before Christ. <laughs> you know? But had he had access? Oh. Yeah. Well, his friends did it for him. You know? Yeah. <laughs> they. You know. But um, no, people have always wondered. You know, they 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 get up and, and they look at Venus. And say, well, what is that? Mm -hmm. You know. Now we know. You know, we, we call it sunrise, but it's really the morning earth turn. But that doesn't sound very good. It's more, what a beautiful morning earth turn. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the glow of the morning earth turn. Yeah. 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 But. Yeah, I think that's true. And then I maybe that's why people become depressed as they become older, you know, like that midlife crisis or something, because you have less to look forward to when you're 20. You have everything to look forward to. Getting married, having kids. Mm -hmm. Those are very exciting events. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. once those things pass and then your kids get older like mm -hmm. the empty nest thing is real mm -hmm. and and then you have you know you're working towards your career and and trying to buy a house and there's all these things to look forward to when you're young mm -hmm. and then when you're older there's so not i mean a vacation isn't the same as building a family or a career or becoming who you're going to become. These are these are great events to look forward to. Mm -hmm. So maybe that is why getting older is hard. Maybe it's why we all resist it. Mm -hmm. Because there's so much less to look forward to. Well, you have to learn, you know, what, what's really important. And once you've taken a couple of very expensive vacations and the uh, visa bill comes in, yeah. you think, 
what was I thinking? That was rather <laughs> expensive. That and cost me a thousand dollars a day yeah. to be waited on down in Jamaica or Hawaii or mm-hmm. wherever. And uh, you know that because there, there's a great rush uh, in this age for experiences. Mm-hmm. And um, and I think what I found where I live now, uh, the the men's group. There's a men's group that we have coffee every Tuesday and Thursday, and I know more people. After four years living in Eastern Washington, than I knew in Seattle after fifty years. Yeah, and I can call any one of these guys if if I had a problem, and it could be a personal problem, or it could be a flat tire, or I could be out of gas. It could be something simple, and um, you know there is really a, a great sense of camaraderie between uh, you know the men that that meet and. We just meet and shoot the breeze and complain about this and that, and mm-hmm. and, um, and they're from all walks of life. You know, we have people that that spent their life in the trades, and we've got other people that uh, were very very wealthy and had um, successful businesses, and 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 yet everyone is. I never ask anybody what did you used to do, you know, because you know I always did that when I was in mm-hmm. Seattle because you want to size them up, uh. you know. Are you are you a peer, or are you greater than I, or are you lesser than I? Is that a guy you know? thing? Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's a man thing. You uh, bet. It what must be because yeah. I I don't care what yeah. people do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I never ask that question. Yeah, but uh, but I never ask that anymore. You know, because yeah. uh, I'm now at this point in my life, I'm more interested in people. You know, and I do a lot of little things for. Uh, you know, the people that, for example, we have, we have movie night and we have a meal Well, I cook the meal, mm-hmm. you know, and, uh, and I have a lot of fun doing it. And, uh, you know, I'm not a cook. I've never cooked anything, but anyway, there was a lovely man, Norm. And, um, I really, I really enjoy talking to him. He's, um, he just had his 80th birthday and, uh, you know, his Kids flew up from Mexico and from yeah. all of, I mean, it, it was, it was really a great time. And his wife, Susan, she, you know, she, you know, we kept, it was a surprise party and trying to keep a surprise party, you know, is, is a difficult thing to do. But yeah, uh, but normally uh, the first meeting I went to, uh, they threw two packs of wieners in boiling water. <laughs> I said, is that what we're having for dinner? Said, yeah, that's it. You know, oh. Um, well, that's what you always made us. Well. <laughs> yeah, but I never liked it. You know? <laughs> it's just the one thing you knew yeah, how to cook. Yeah. I told Nora, I said, well, I, let, let me do the cooking. I think I can do better than that. So um, I started cooking. Yeah. And uh, and I'd practice at home, different things. And, and they say, you're kind of experimenting with this, aren't you? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, do you, you like you, olives and chili? <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. You know, and... Um, so, but it, it's a lot of fun. And, you know, they all often come down and and, uh, and help. And oh, we fun. watch a movie, but we eat a, eat a meal and, and we have a good time. You yeah. Know? And, um, but uh, at that level, you know, we're, I'm just amazed at how much information these men share with each other. I mean, yeah. we, we really do. We talk about our families, our kids and challenges. And, so is that, yeah. do you think that's an age thing where you just become more open on... And just more more interested in who people are as people as you get older, and you just don't care about the competitive side of things anymore. I, yeah, yeah, very, very, very possibly. And uh, but I, I think you know when you have the time to actually get to know people, you know, when you're really, really busy, you yeah. just don't have the time to get to know them, mm-hmm. and they don't have the time to get to know you. And um, you know, so I think it's. it's part of the fact that so many of the men are retired and they're not doing any, anything. And we can sit there and if the conversation's interesting, we'll sit around for three hours. Yeah. And, um, and yeah, I think that's great. Yeah. Yeah. It really is. I really yeah. enjoyed, uh, the time with them and, um, and you know, it's every, every few months there's a, an empty chair and someone passes away and, Oh. and then somebody else moves into the area and, uh, the chair is filled. Oh. But uh, that is the nature of being in your 70s and 80s, having 90s. A, having a grandpa talk group there. Yeah, yeah. Oh. But uh, That's sad. Yeah. I, I've learned that, you know, that, that life is fleeting. Yeah. And that, um, you know, it says in the scriptures that our, our life is like a vapor of smoke. 
Yeah. You know, you're here one minute and you're gone the next. And uh, really does go quickly. Oh, but, yeah. And I think that's something too that I notice a lot of people as they get older get more in tune with that that kind of end of things. Like used to have us watch this Bible teacher on TV, Les Feldick. Yeah, right. And then I was like, Dad, I don't want to watch this. Look at everybody in the audience. Yeah. Like everyone in the audience is like 97 years old. And you're like, well, why do you think that is? Yeah. Like, do you think that maybe it's because they're ending, you know, they're they're nearing the end of their life and they're realizing that this stuff is important and maybe mm-hmm. you should start paying attention. Yeah. <laughs> and you'd be like, get out your tablet and start yeah. taking notes. Yeah. And and you were right, because that's what happens. You start realizing that all these other distractions mm-hmm. that we think are so important really aren't. And mm-hmm. then as people near the end of their lives, all of a sudden those distractions don't matter anymore. And now they want to know why are they here and where are they going? Mm-hmm. And that's really all that matters. Mm-hmm. And so now they want to get right mm-hmm. with their creator. They want to get right with their religion or with their their set of beliefs so that they know where they're going. Mm-hmm. So I always found that really interesting. So I thought that it was just a bunch of old people listening to Les Feldick because they didn't have anything else to do, but they were doing it because they realized the importance of it. Mm-hmm. And but you know, at twenty years old, I that I didn't realize that. No, um, well, it's um, I think that you know Dennis Prager. You know, he's got that radio show out of Southern California, and every Wednesday afternoon, I think the third hour. Um, he does the ultimate issues hour. And, uh, and I, I think, I wish you'd do it all three hours on Wednesday, but <laughs> he has the ultimate issues where yeah. he talks about the ultimate issues of life. And uh, he, he started his radio broadcast down in Los Angeles 30 years ago with a program called Religion on the Line. Mm-hmm. And he would get a rabbi, he's Jewish, he would get a rabbi and he would get a Catholic priest and then he'd get some ecumenical uh, minister of some sort, and then they would discuss a topic, and people would call in, and it turned out to be one of the most popular radio shows Sunday night. They had like seventy-five or eighty percent of the listening audience in Los Angeles. Wow! You know, on on a Sunday night, hmm. and um, so yeah, I think people are kind of craving what's real, and and um, you know, less of there's so much nonsense on the internet and on television now that I think that when there's something that's real, I, I think people really tune in and, and appreciate that. Mm-hmm. And and it is unfortunate that we don't realize this stuff until we are much older, because mm-hmm. if we could harness the wisdom and then like smush it in the brain of like a 20 year old, mm-hmm. that would be fantastic. Think of the things they could do with the wisdom of someone who's 74, but they have it at 20, but it, it just, that's not how life works. Mm-hmm. And maybe we gain that wisdom as we age, but I mean, I think so much is wasted. 20-year-olds are different now than they used to be. Mm-hmm. I mean, people during World War II were lying about their age to enlist into the military. Mm-hmm. And now, mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, now 20-year-olds are very different. They say that 30 is a new 20. And I think that that's such a mistake to tell young people. Like, don't get married. Don't start your family. Don't start your career. Don't do any of these things till you're 30. Enjoy your 20s. Party through your 20s. Mm-hmm. And you always told us, no, 20s are for grinding. You work your ass off in your 20s. Mm-hmm. You start your career. You start your family. You start, you know, date with purpose. Mm-hmm. Because now you don't have the little, I mean, I had kids pretty early, 23. But, you know, in your 20s, you don't have the kids and you don't have, that's when you grind. That's when you establish yourself. Because mm-hmm. there's always somebody who is doing Mm -hmm. that. And then you just get left behind. If you don't start any of those things till you're 30, Mm -hmm. it's too late for a lot of it because there are the people that started in their 20s. Not a lot, Mm -hmm. but man, if you start at 20 working towards that career, you're going to be so much further ahead than everyone that's out partying. Mm -hmm. And that's a hard, like kids don't want to hear that. I didn't want to hear that. I wanted to go off fun. Yeah, I I moved to Las Vegas at 21. Obviously that party ended quickly at the birth of Nevaeh. So... But that's what I I wanted to go do that. And you were like, no, no, you need to start your career. You need to buy a house. And I was like, buy a house? (laughs) I was like 20 years old. I don't want to buy a house. You're like, you have to invest in real estate. Yeah. (laughs) And And you got a real estate license. I did. I I did. That was more out of necessity. But, But I think that was, that's so true. If only, you know, all these things that you said, if only we had just listened, you know, if Mm. kids would just listen maybe (laughs) to Mm. their parents a little more. Then, then I think things would work out. But I, I hate that whole 30 is a new 20. I do not think that kids should be 
being kids in their 20s. I think that is the time to start being an adult, Mm -hmm. start building that career, start making that family. And Mm -hmm. and so, yeah, I'm struggling with society right now and and trying to combat the trends of today with raising kids. Mm -hmm. And then they get so much of that on the internet and then me saying that, no, no, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. Just, I don't know. I know what... I know what it feels like to be the harper and I know what it feels like to be the one that's harped on. So Mm -hmm. I'm just, I'm kind of right in the middle of that. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that long ago you were saying all the same same things that I'm now saying to the kids. Mm -hmm. So it's just funny to go full circle and then go, oh, that's why you said that. Mm -hmm. That's right. And uh, if a person, you know, can can make as many mistakes as you're going to make, you know, in the first couple of years, like, mm-hmm. you know, I've always been an, an advocate of, of people having their own business and you should start with, you know, that's why you, you, you started with the, the little cookie business, because if you can be successful with a cookie business, you can be successful with any business that the product is irrelevant. And I learned that from John Paul Getty and he wrote a wonderful book called business is business. And that's where I got the idea. That's why I thought, if I can get inside the mind of John Paul Getty, the richest man in America at the time, well, maybe not the richest, but he was in the top 10, that's for sure. And, um, you know, and, and you know, this, he said he could not hire himself. He would not hire himself. He said, I, I'm not qualified to work at my own company. And he owned it. And he laid out what he would expect out of any employee. He said he would never hire anybody that wasn't married. Hmm. He said, because that man has got to bring home a bacon. He's far more responsible than a single person. A single man might be able to work more hours, you know, but it's, it's an entirely different motivation when you're married. And um, so it, it, Business is Business was the name of the book, and it's an excellent book for any entrepreneur that, that ever wants to have a business to read what John Paul Getty laid out because he was pretty successful when yeah. he did. And, um, you know, that... that I, I, I'm a big advocate of learning, standing on the shoulders of those that went before us. Yeah. And um, it's a big mistake to think that because we have more technology today, that we're smarter yeah. than Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> we're not <laughs> right. smarter than Abraham Lincoln, and we're not smarter than David or Solomon. Mm-hmm. You know, read Kings, First and Second Kings. You know, these were real people in real times, with real challenges. I mean, David has his son, Absalom, turn on him and cause a civil war and try to overthrow the old man's kingdom. Yeah, just stay out of Psalm of Psalms. Yeah. (laughs) He's a real pervert in that book. Well, well, Solomon, he did have a problem with women. (laughs) He really (laughs) liked it. Yeah, so did David. That's what got him into trouble. Yeah. But, well... Well, this is, I mean, we're running over an hour now, but this has been really fun. I hope we can do it again because, oh. yeah, I mean, this, these are the conversations we have on the phone all the time. Mm-hmm. And so it's just been fun to do it in this environment. And yeah, I just, I mean, I just appreciate being able to have these open dialogues with you and being able to just call you up and have these just crazy conversations that go in 10 different directions. Mm-hmm. It's fun. I hope I can do that with my kids. I hope that they look back at their childhood in the same way that I look back on mine. A lot of people look back on their childhood and and they feel damaged with this or that or and they want to mm-hmm. try to make up for it with my kids. But like I always told Jeremy, my my childhood was so great that like the reason I do the things that I do with my kids or the way that I talk to our kids mm-hmm. is because I'm trying to emulate my childhood. Mm-hmm. I want them to have what I have. And so I really appreciate, you know, just your intentional parenting. It was I I think that it's something that maybe I don't say enough or that maybe I've never said to you, but I appreciate it immensely. I think you did a fantastic job just letting us be us. We both have um, such a great sense of self and confidence and we just go after whatever we want to go after because you always told us we could. Mm -hmm. And so that's such a valuable thing. So I hope I can give that to my own kids. Oh, yeah. Well, both you and Alicia um, have just been real tigers. And, uh, you know, Alicia's, you know, she's, um, she is a, uh, a real spirit mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, yeah. she's got her own business mm-hmm. and, uh, she had one before that. I mean, commercial flooring, really? Yeah. That doesn't sound like any fun. You told her the product didn't matter. Product didn't matter. Yeah. You know, and, um, so, you know, if you can run a commercial flooring business, you can run 
a gym, which yeah. is what she's doing now. Mm -hmm. She owns a gym. She owns it all. Yeah. She, has, she has no expenses. Yeah. And, um, you know, so, and she's, you know, looking at other things like uh, a winery. Yeah. You know, why not? Why you not? Know, wine, gym, <laughs> pumping iron, you yeah. know, putting down flooring. Yeah, whatever you like. You, exactly. You find your passion and make it work. And, yeah. and that's, I think, a great thing. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it was a, it was a, it was a fun time. I hope we can continue having these conversations and we'll have to have you back on the podcast again now that you've been on your first podcast do you think it was fun oh i it was a, a blast <laughs> that's good really you ever think it. that not only did you ever wonder if you'd be on a podcast but with having a conversation with your own child on a podcast <laughs> no no that that that's such a weird thing never crossed my mind yeah it never crossed my mm -hmm. mind until about a month and a half ago either mm -hmm. i don't know how we ended up here well i think it's it's a wonderful thing and and i'm so proud of you and uh, your sister, and uh, and but you know what you and Jeremy have done here is you know you guys work so hard. I mean, not, you know you make it look easy, but it's not. <laughs> no. Yeah, and uh, yeah. you know your channel. Um, when when I see you know, well, I mean, just looking at the garage today, you know, I haven't I haven't been here for about four months, and um, I mean Jeremy, you know, he is such a hard worker. Yeah, and uh, but. When he, he's building and you're editing and, you know, it's a 16 hour day, mm -hmm. you know, there's not this, this eight hours a day, um, you know, 32 hour work week. That's <laughs> not going to get it done. No jo job stands just over broke. Yeah. You're just over broke. And, 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 uh, so, you know, you, you guys are just amazing. Just amazing. And, and, and you know, when I talked to Jeremy, he said, you know, he gives you all the credit. You know, uh, when I talk to you, you give him all the credit, you know, so. Yeah, so uh, that's what makes it go around, I guess. Yeah. Is just appreciating one another. Yeah, so. Well, again, the Bible says don't be unequally yoked, you know, and, um, you know, if you're, if you, if you, you know, two people can get an awful lot more done than, than. Yeah. Two people working individually. Yeah. You know, and, uh, cause you're on the same page, you're going the same direction. And so, um. Yeah. So we are, I hope this podcast thing just just flourishes because... Uh, this was Jeremy's idea. Yeah. I mean, he loves podcasts. And so I said, you know, okay, if that's what you want to do. But it is nice because it lets us get away. And then we were just able to kind of immerse ourselves in the conversation. So mm -hmm. we've been having a lot of fun doing it. I do hope that we can continue doing it for a long time because it is cool. It's mm -hmm. a very unique thing to be able to go just sit here and, and do. So Well, there's so many wonderful, interesting subjects that uh, can be broached mm -hmm. and um, you know and we live in such a political time you know that peanut butter is political you everything's know? I mean, everything. political and it's a shame it's just a crying shame I know it's, um, it makes it hard because yeah. you want to talk about current events yeah. but then then you're always going to offend somebody yeah but so. we're, we're all Americans and uh, and you know th this country when it pulls together you know can do anything mm -hmm. but when it's torn apart it's um, it's very very damaging and it's just uh, it's just a crying shame. I just hope that um, you know people will will start pulling together and saying, you know, it's egos. You know, yeah. politicians have big egos, and, and uh, they always have. They always will. Mm -hmm. That's why Caesar was Caesar. You know, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, uh, Didn't work out in the end. <laughs> no, 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 no. It was kind of dangerous being Caesar. Yeah. You know you. You know. Yeah. Heights of March. You too, Brutus. <laughs> you know? I know. Yeah. I, I hope people can pull together as well. I we're trying to encourage just good, healthy dialogue. I think that's really what it comes down to is we need to be able to sit and have conversations. Mm -hmm. And if we say something that you don't agree with, that doesn't, it doesn't mean that you don't need, that you need to check out and never yeah. listen to the podcast. Like, let's disagree. Let's talk about yeah. it. Let's, and then think that's okay. Yeah. And I think that's really healthy. When you lose that dialogue is, is when you, mm -hmm. when you stop growing as a country you need to be able to talk and, and discuss stuff and, and that's always how we've grown and so i do hope we can come back to being able to have open dialogue without offense where mm -hmm. offense isn't meant and um it's okay to disagree mm -hmm. yeah we are still we're all humans we all you know still americans so yeah, yeah i agree hopefully yeah, the first amendment is absolutely essential mm -hmm. and the, you know the first amendment movement came out of uh california you know, in the seventies and uh, out of Berkeley. And that is, you know, <laughs> I will, I will defend to my dying drop of blood, your right 
to say something. And mm-hmm. now it's like, you know, if you hurt somebody's feelings, um, then you can't say it. Yeah. Well, you're, if you can't, if you can't talk, then you can't think. And, um, and if someone else can't talk, you can't listen. That's right. So, so, so it's a dangerous thing to start, to start saying you can't say that you can't think that because now there's no more dialogue Mm -hmm. and, and now you just live in some fascist society where only one side rules and that's, that's a scary thing. So hopefully we can, more people will start having these open dialogues and we hope to be able to have some interesting people on that. Mm -hmm. Hopefully we completely disagree with, I think that would be great. And I just encouraging dialogue is important. So you bet. yeah, well, I appreciate you being here. I appreciate you spending, I guess it's been an hour and 20 minutes of your, your day with us, but I guess we should get back to family. Now we got a birthday to celebrate. We do we have three birthdays. Yeah. yeah. So, all right, well, let's get back at it. And we appreciate all of you guys for tuning in today. This has been a really fun conversation. It's always a, a vulnerable spot to have a family member come on and, and talk about, themselves and things from the past. So I appreciate mm. you being here. Thanks, well, Dad. Oh, you bet. <laughs> Darling, any, anytime. <laughs> All right.